Well, thank you very much for that, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I just want to start by saying I had a little paranoid spasm over lunch. My phone started playing up. Um, I get, kept getting these calls from someone who was jabbering away at me in German, and I kept explaining, well, it's the wrong number, you've rung the wrong number, why are you ringing me? And then I suddenly thought, they're trying to keep me on the line so they can triangulate the call and work out where I am. So I put the phone down, and then they kept trying to ring me back. So I don't know what's going on, but if anyone of our little friends from the intelligence agencies is watching today, I just want to say I'm not going to be breaking any laws, I'm just going to be talking about stuff that is already in the public domain. But such is the life of the, uh, the, the sort of half-life of the whistleblower turned political activist. You do end up sort of eating yourself with paranoia sometimes. But today I just want to talk a little bit about what it's like to actually be recruited and work as an intelligence officer or a spy and then look at some of the reasons, some of the issues that I and my former partner, uh, David Shaler, uh, what we saw going wrong and why we decided to blow the whistle. But really I want to extrapolate out from that personal story into the current situation, um, the sort of stresses and strains on the media when it comes to reporting these sort of stories, and also what it's like for whistleblowers nowadays. I mean, would you go to a newspaper? Would you go to WikiLeaks, for example? All those sort of issues and what the future is for those sort of um, topics. But just to start off, um, there are three key agencies in the UK, three key spy agencies. It's a bit like the US set up. So we have um, MI5, which is the UK Domestic Security Service, and they used to truncate that down uh, when they were abroad and they had to represent the service to UKSS until some bright spark from Germany, I think it was, mentioned that that might, might not have very good connotations. There's also MI6, which is the sort of James Bond intelligence gathering wing. Um, well, they like to think they're James Bond anyway. And those two agencies have been around for about 100 years. They celebrated their centenary uh, last year. And on top of that, we also have the government communications headquarters, GCHQ, which does all the sort of telephone eavesdropping stuff and links very closely in with the American NSA organization. And for the first 100 years, oh sorry, the first 80 years of their existence, the spies didn't actually officially exist in the UK. So they were completely off the books. Nobody was allowed to ask questions about what they were getting up to. Uh, no MP could ask questions about uh, scandals that were erupting or anything. It was utterly deniable. But things changed in the 1980s. There were a series of scandals, and this meant that eventually MI5 was put on a legal footing in 1989 under the Security Service Act. MI6 and GCHQ followed suit five years later. And this is key, really, because I was approached to be recruited to work for MI5 in 1990. And because they had come out of the shadows to a certain extent, because they now were expected to obey the law to a large extent, it appeared much more attractive. If they'd approached me earlier than that, I would have run screaming. Well, in fact, I almost did run screaming because I never wanted to be a spy. I was never one of these sort of spy geeks. Um, I actually wanted to be a diplomat. I quite fancied the idea of swanning around embassy parties, you know, drinking champagne. So I applied to our foreign office in the UK and was somewhat startled to receive a letter on Ministry of Defence note paper, which said there may be other jobs I would find more interesting. I don't know why, but my gut instinct was, oh my God, it's MI5. <laughs> it's a really strange response. I was really frightened. I, you know, they had quite a bad reputation at that point. They still do. So I was going to ignore that letter. I mean, it was quite intriguing. It said, you know, if you're interested, ring this number. Unfortunately, my father was in the room when I opened the letter and went, oh, and he was an investigative journalist, and he was also a bit of a spy geek. So, of course, he was the one saying, oh, please just ring up, see if it is MI5. Go on, please, please, please. <laughs> so every time he complained about the whistleblowing afterwards, I just, well, look, Dad, it was your fault. You got me into it. <laughs> anyway, I was there for six years. Um, the whole recruitment process took about... 10 months. It was very long, very intensive. And they did make very reassuring noises about the fact they had to obey the law. We had long ethical discussions where they seemed to be okay. Um, so, and I kept getting through to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. So I thought, well, okay, perhaps this is the right job for me. They also emphasized as well that their area of work was shifting because up until that point, they'd been very much counter espionage and counter subversion, which is sort of looking at reds under the bed. But of course, by 1990, even MI5 had noticed that the Cold War was over and the Berlin Wall had come down, so they were scouting around for new areas of work, especially the lead in investigating the provisional IRA on the UK mainland, and around that time they sort of wrestled it away from the police. 
So they told me at the time, they wanted a new generation of intelligence officers. Those who could do fast-paced, investigative, evidential-based investigations into terrorist targets. And this, of course, was in the good old days when um, the notion was you investigated someone, you gathered evidence, if it, they had committed a crime, you gave that evidence to the Crown Prosecution Service and they were put on trial in front of a jury of their peers, which seems quite a quaint notion now, whereas, you know, people are just sort of extraordinarily rendered or tortured or assassinated these days if they're even suspected of being a terrorist. Anyway, I was there for about six years and David Shaler joined around the same time and was there for just a few months less. And in those six years, we had three postings each. You get moved around every two years to a new subject area. And the first posting for both of us was in a little section called F2, which was indeed looking at counter-subversion targets. This is the very thing they said they'd stop doing. So that was a bit of a shock. The first sort of intimation that perhaps they hadn't been entirely truthful during the recruitment process. But it did give us a very in-depth historical perspective on what the spies had got up to in the bad old days. I mean, they were running rampant across the UK, targeting anyone who was even friends with someone who might be involved in a Trotskyist or a communist organisation. I mean, it was a very large-scale investigative uh, job at the time. But it also meant that we saw in 1992, when there was a general election in the UK, files held on politicians. Now, why do we see that? It's because in the UK at that time, if anyone stood as an MP, they had their names checked against MI5's records. And um, if, an, if that name came up, the file was retrieved, it was reviewed by us in F2, and a summary, a recommendation was sent out to the head of that political party saying, this so-and-so is a bit of a threat, we can't really say why, but you might want to consider it if, you, if they get elected and you want them in your cabinet or in the government or whatever. So we saw a whole range of files coming out, and these people weren't terribly famous in those days. You know, we're talking minor players like Tony Blair and Jack Straw and Peter Mandelson and the late Robin Cook. So pretty much anyone who was anyone in the last Labour government in the UK had an MI5 file. And it's quite strange to think. I mean, thinking about the approach of the Labour government when they were in power, they were hardly the most left-leaning people. So I suppose sometime in their sort of distant youth, they might have been slightly more left left-wing activist. It's hard to remember. Anyway, I do think that that's an important point because to have those people in government, they were in positions like being foreign secretary or the home secretary, where they were the political masters of the spies. And you have these people knowing they've got files, not knowing what's on those files. So it's very much a case of the tail wagging the dog democratically, I think. It was a real problem. Anyway, that was uh, the first section. We both then worked in the Irish terrorism section. And I won't dwell too long on that, but there are a couple of instances where bombs could and should have been prevented on the UK mainland, and mistakes were made, and innocent people died. And also, MI5 got away with it, because they could lie in their operational briefing to government about exactly what had happened. So they could just brush any mistakes under the carpet. And in fact, in one case, David was told directly not to rock the boat, just don't mention it. But it was in the last section that we saw the most heinous things going wrong, really. There were three key points. We were working in G branch at the time, and this is the international terrorism branch in MI5. And the first issue came up when David uh, was posted to head up the Libyan section. And there was a, an investigation in place already targeting a journalist in Fleet Street. And this is someone who was the deputy foreign editor of the Guardian newspaper, a woman called Victoria Britton, who specialised in African affairs and had links to a Nigerian diplomat, I think called Kojo Tisakata. And that diplomat, MI5 thought, had some sort of links to the Libyan regime. And money was being sent from Kojo Tisakata to Victoria Britain's bank accounts, which MI5 traced. And it was quite large sums of money, so they got terribly excited. It was like, great, we can investigate a lefty journalist, just like the good old days. And it turned out that this money was nothing nefarious. If they bothered even to read her articles in The Guardian, they would have seen that what she was doing was holding money for a libel action that Tissicata was carrying out in the UK at the time. That was it. But they ignored that. They didn't bother checking in open source um, areas what she was getting up to, why she might be linked to Tissicata. They just immediately, knee-jerk reaction was to slap on a telephone tap onto all her phones. Now, under the law, which they were supposed to obey, 
post 1989 Security Service Act, they were supposed to exhaust all external remedies before invading someone's privacy by using a telephone tap. So this was an illegal operation, and a gross violation of her privacy, and it actually cost in the region of uh, three quarters of a million pounds um, just to bug her phone for six months. Anyway, that was eventually shut down. David shut that one down. And then there were two other operations that caused us grave concern. And the first one was the bombing of the Israeli embassy in London in 1994. Now, in this case, a very sophisticated car bomb was parked outside the Israeli embassy, exploded. Nobody, thankfully, was killed or seriously hurt. And uh, there were very few leads to go on. I mean, it was an incredibly sophisticated device which ate its own forensics during the explosion. I mean, even the IRA couldn't make bombs that sophisticated at that time. And uh, the police and MI5 were pretty blind about this. But anyway, they went out and they rounded up a whole bunch of Palestinian students and activists who were based in London at that time, who were very involved in a, a political pressure group fighting for the people in the Gaza and the West Bank. And two of those people eventually were charged, tried, and convicted of conspiring to cause that explosion. And for that, they got 20 years in prison each. It was a young woman called Samar Alami and a young man called Jawed Botme. And they always proclaimed their innocence. In fact, they stayed in prison until I think about two years ago. And this is despite the fact that MI5 appeared to know that they weren't guilty. In fact, the final uh, official report written up by the senior investigating officer, whose code number was G91, actually stated that he thought Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, had carried out the explosion itself, a sort of controlled explosion. Now, if you read that on the internet, you think, oh my God, wacky conspiracy theory. <laughs> but as I said, this was G91, and he didn't really have a reputation for being bonkers at the time anyway. So. Then you would say, well, why would they do that? And again, there appeared to be two reasons. One was that um, the Israeli authorities were always lobbying for much more security around their interests in London, because, of course, they were worried about the Londonistan sort of aspect, the fact there seemed to be a lot of uh, Arab Islamist terrorist possible suspects in London. So that was one issue, because um, MI5 kept saying, well, we see no direct threat. And of course, if you let off a controlled explosion, safely, relatively, then, of course, you immediately get your additional security. But also, and crucially, I think, because these two students were part of this wider Palestinian support network, um, that very effectively shattered that network, and everyone else sort of ran for the hills, and it never really got back on its feet. So, you know, that would be, again, a sort of political advantage that Mossad would see they would have gained by doing something like that. Now, the final case um, is very resonant today of all days, because this was an illegal assassination attempt funded by MI6 against Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. Um, and this was well, probably the most heinous thing we could think of at the time, but obviously, in the light of the last 24 hours, it seems that finally, finally, mission has indeed been accomplished, because the very group that was backed way back in 1996 is also the same group linked to the rebels who have now taken Gaddafi out and extrajudicially shot him. Um, but at least I suppose it was done more openly this time. In the 1990s, what happened was there was a, a volunteer, a Libyan walk-in, who went to the British Embassy in Tunis in 1995 and said, I want to see the resident spy, please. And it's always very easy to find your local spook because they always work under diplomatic cover. So he volunteered to the local MI6 officer and he said he had a ragtag group of Islamic extremists in Libya who wanted to try and get rid of Gaddafi to topple him in a coup. And to do this, they needed some help from MI6, including funding, so that they could even buy the basics, like you know the tents, the jeeps, the explosives, the guns, and train up. And with very few checks, MI6 just suddenly started funneling money to this man, who they codenamed Tomworth. And David, as I said, was working at that time as the head of the Libyan section. And he had an unusually friendly working relationship with his counterpart in MI6, so he was briefed about this all the way down the line. Normally, the two agencies hate each other and guard their, their information. You know, knowledge is power. But they were talking about this. And he was concerned. And he raised this matter with his bosses and everything. But he also thought, well, you know, MI6 is always coming up with these sort of James Bond wannabe crackpot schemes, and usually nothing ever comes of it, so he was quite sort of relaxed about it for the first few months. 
But then in 1996, early 1996, he was sitting at his desk in MI5 and all these different reports started appearing from different sources saying there had been an explosion under a car um, in a cavalcade in which Colonel Gaddafi was travelling. And ironically, coming back from a Libyan People's Congress in Sirte, he was travelling back to Tripoli and there'd been an explosion under a car, but obviously the wrong car. So Gaddafi survived that, and uh, innocent people died in that explosion. And innocent people also died in the ensuing security shootout. So David, of course, was somewhat startled by this, and said, well, you know, to his MI6 contact, well, you know, was that you? And he told me that the MI6 guy uh, turned around and said a sort of note of triumph, yes, we did it, that was our guy. Although apparently, you know, they hadn't, because Gaddafi was still alive. Anyway, under the terms of the 1996 Intelligence Service Act, uh, 1994 Intelligence Service Act that governs MI6, there is a provision, Section 7, that says if they want to carry out illegal acts abroad, but they get the prior written permission from their political master, the Foreign Secretary, then they will have legal immunity for breaking that law. And it turned out in this case that they hadn't bothered to get that legal uh, clearance. So we're looking at a situation now where MI6 is funding uh, an Islamist group in Libya. And of course, at that time, MI5 was already studying Islamist groups across the world, including this group. So they funded our terrorist enemies. They did it in an illegal operation, murdered innocent people, and didn't achieve their objective. And it was all done in a highly volatile part of the world. So we, we really couldn't understand how they could get involved in something so heinous. We hadn't signed up to the intelligence community to get involved in state-sponsored terrorism, which is what this effectively was. So we decided to resign and blow the whistle. Now, in the UK, it's very difficult to know what to do. If you experience crime on the inside of the intelligence agencies, there's very few places you can go legally under the terms of the 1989 Official Secrets Act, which basically says that if you've worked as an intelligence officer, you can never say anything to anyone ever outside the agency about your work. So theoretically, you can only go to the head of that agency if you want to complain about something you've seen going wrong. So you can probably imagine how many complaints are upheld on that system. You can't even go to your MP or your police or the police legally under the terms of the OSA. It's very, very stringent law. So we calculated that perhaps the best thing to do would be to go public and get the media on side and they would push for an inquiry and perhaps there'd be a review and they'd rein in the spies. So we did. Um, before we resigned, which we did in 1996, we didn't want to continue working for that agency. Um, David had found a journalist to work with and over the period of 10 months after we'd resigned, they sort of had a very long courtship phase trying to get to know if they could trust each other. Eventually, they did. So eventually, the story broke in um, August 1997. And about three days before the story broke, uh, the editor of the newspaper, which was the Mail on Sunday, turned to David and said, well, what do you want to do? You know, you're facing prison. And David said, uh, rather unfortunately, oh, I think we should go away for a few weeks, um, get out of the country until it settles down a bit. Um, so we packed our bags and we fled. And we were actually away for three years in the end. But um, the story broke in 1997. And we ended up literally on the run around Europe for the first month, moving from hotel to hotel, just paying cash, you know, changing our appearance, everything. And um, during that time, the government took out a swinging injunction against David Shaler, the whistleblower, and also the whole of the national media in the UK. And they also went into our home in central London and conducted a counter-terrorism style search, trying to find something related to MI5. And a counter-terrorism style search is not a pretty sight. They basically rip the furniture apart, they rip up the carpets, floorboards, even the bath gets taken apart. Anyway, thankfully we knew nothing about this during our sort of surreal little backpacking holiday around uh, Europe that summer. But after a month, I decided to go back. I wanted to prove, I mean, I'd done nothing wrong at that point. I was just Shayla's girlfriend. I wanted to prove that I was free to travel backwards and forwards between the UK and, and wherever we ended up. And uh, I flew back with my lawyer, who was the head of Liberty, it's a civil liberties organization in the UK, to be picked up at the immigration desk. Um, and they arrested me under the Official Secrets Act and took me away and interviewed me for the day. I was never, ever charged with anything, but I was kept on police bail for six months. But it got worse because uh, the next morning, David's brother and his two best friends were arrested in coordinated dawn raids by the secret police in the UK too on trumped up charges. And again, they were never charged with anything, but they were held on police bail for six months. 
I think it was a sort of mechanism of keeping David under control because he didn't want his brother, his friends and his girlfriend prosecuted in any way. Anyway, I had a week in the UK packing up the ripped up flat, you know, trying to comfort our distraught families who'd had no warning about what was going to break because we were so twitchy about security. And then I went to rejoin David in France where we hid in a little French farmhouse uh, right down three hours due south of, of Paris. Very remote, very primitive. And we were there for about 10 months, we think in hiding, and we were trying to negotiate via our lawyer for David's return to the UK. We wanted um, there to be an inquiry. He wanted to give his evidence about the most serious allegation, particularly the Gaddafi plot, without necessarily having to be prosecuted for doing it. But the government kept stalling, kept stalling. So eventually, eventually, um, in the summer of 1998, the Gaddafi plot story did finally emerge. The newspaper had been sitting on it because they were so worried about the, uh, the gravity of the issue. They wanted to do some, some research themselves. So the story appeared in August 1998, and David disappeared in August 1998. Um, he was snatched off the street by the French secret police, the DST, and put in a secret prison um, called La Sante, where he, he sort of was hidden away for four months. And they treated him incredibly strictly, because the British government told the French he was some sort of traitor. And then finally, when the Brits handed over the paperwork about the case, they realized, actually, no, he was a whistleblower. And that changed the whole thing. And the French pretty much immediately released him because thank you to France, they have a good constitution. And they say that if anyone blows the whistle on matters like this, it is a political action and they do not extradite people for political actions. So I have to say, if anyone ever wants to blow the whistle in here, I recommend France, it's a very safe haven. <laughs> So after that, we had another two years. We didn't go back to our little remote farmhouse. We, just, we could live more openly in Paris at that point. And we had two more years of really trying to push for an inquiry and get more information out into the media. And during that time, another intelligence officer came out and supported us in public in the newspapers. And also an, a very interesting document emerged from MI6, basically supporting um, the Gaddafi plot, and yet the British government still ignored it and still tried to say it was all pure fantasy, we're just, you know, we're not going to investigate. Anyway, David uh, eventually returned to the UK in summer 2000. He went back voluntarily, knowing he'd be arrested, knowing he'd be put on trial, but he was only ever charged with the very early disclosures about polit politicians' files, that sort of thing. They never charged him with the Gaddafi plot because they didn't want that evidence in court. And he thought he'd be put on trial relatively quickly, but it took over two years to get in front of a jury. And the reason it took so long is because the British government went through a whole series of pre-trial hearings, making legal rulings that hedged in the whistleblower so much that he couldn't actually defend himself in court. He couldn't say anything in his own defence. Even when he wanted to cross-examine witnesses, he had to have his questions vetted by the prosecution lawyer and by the judge. So, you know, the concept of fair trials in the UK was uh, not really there. So needless to say, he was convicted. Um, I think the jury had some inkling that, you know, there had, there had been a bit of a cover-up because quite a lot of the jury had tears in their eyes when they said guilty. And he went to prison for uh, six months. I suppose though, in a way, one of the worst things, most damaging things for him was the way that the media worked after his conviction because I was sitting there in the courtroom watching the journalists taking down the final official judgment by the judge at the end of the case. And he said that he accepted that David Shaler had done what he'd done in the public interest. He accepted that he had no financial motivation for doing it. And um, he accepted that no lives had ever been put at risk by this whistleblowing. Well, I thought, okay, that was fair enough. Anyway, the headlines the next day pretty much said exactly the opposite. It was something like, Shaler sells agent lives down the river for money. I thought, where the hell did that come from? Were well, you not sitting in the same courtroom as me? So, of course, that was incredibly reputationally damaging. Anyway, um, because of all these experiences, um, dealing with the intelligence agencies up front and personal, dealing with the media in some ways even more up front and personal, obviously I developed quite a sort of healthy interest in the interlinkage between the two. So now I really want to pull back and talk briefly about um, how they do uh, interrelate and manage each other. And... Um, I think it's, best, it's fair to say that in the UK, the spy agencies are probably the least accountable and most legally protected of any spy agency in any Western democracy. And this is because there's a whole battery of laws that can be used to stifle coverage or criticism of the intelligence service world. 
I mean, not just the secrecy laws, but they've used libel laws, um, they've used terrorism laws to try and stop uh, journalists talking to sources, potentially in terrorist groups. They have this voluntary censorship uh, committee, which is made up of senior spies and senior media figures, called the Defence Broadcasting Press Advisory Committee, which can voluntarily slap what they call a DA notice onto any story that might cause embarrassment to the spies. Uh, we also have this wonderful thing of injunctions, and now super injunctions in the British media, where you can't even mention that there is an injunction in place. And the government equivalent of that is already there. It's called the Public Interest Immunity Certificate, um, colloquially, colloquially known as the uh, gagging order, which was used massively during the Shaler case as well. So they have all these laws that they can use to stifle reporting, and because there's such men so many of them, Journalists actually end up self-censoring quite often. They're too frightened to push an intelligent story. And of course, there is the Official Secrets Act itself, which I have to say was put in place, I think, purely to stop whistleblowing. We had a 1911 Official Secrets Act, which is there to stop treachery, people betraying their secrets to an enemy power. If you get caught under that, you go to prison for 14 years, and that provision is still in place. The 1989 Act changed specifically to say that intelligence officers can't talk to anyone outside the intelligence agencies. So the whistleblower is persecuted, prosecuted, but also notoriously under Section 5 of the Official Secrets Act, journalists can also be sent to prison for two years for reporting those stories if they cause damage. Now, I was at another journalism conference uh, last week, and there were some Russian journalists there talking about covering the FSB, the new KGB, and they were saying, well, yes, of course, the whistleblowers can go to prison, but Journalists are exempt. They won't get prosecuted criminally for exposing intelligence crimes. So I'm sitting in a room thinking, oh, that's great. That's just a great example of British democracy when, you know, you can report on the bloody FSB, but you can't report on MI5, you know, if you're a journalist and you go to prison. Anyway, um, so yes, they've got this whole array of different laws which the spies hide behind. They're perfectly protected. And then that's the sort of stick element of how the spies can manage and control the media. But there's also a sort of carrot element in this as well, the stick and the carrot where journalists who report on issues like intelligence or defence or home affairs need access to people, where they will be given briefings by those people, they will be given stories, and if they report those stories without too much fuss, they will continue to get that drip feed of information, so they can continue to do their job. Of course, if they get a bit bolshy and then decide, I'm going to investigate this, this is a bit fishy, and they don't do what they're told to do, they will be excluded from that charm secret circle, they won't get the briefings, they can't do their job. So that's a very sort of subtle leverage. Then you can up it a notch. If you're a spook and you've got someone in your charm circle who seems quite amenable to what you're saying, you can actually get them to work as what is known as an agent of influence within their media organisation, where they will tip off the spies if a particularly juicy story seems to be about to break, where they can be used to spin a certain story if that newspaper is running with it, where they can even feed back information about what their fellow journalists might be working on. Uh, there's a very famous journalist called David Rose who outed himself about this um, a couple of years ago in the British media and he said, you know, Mayor Culpa, I did this for 10 years but I can't stand it anymore, I'm coming, out. <coughs> um, and what else do we have? We also have, someone mentioned this morning in one excellent talk, the notion of uh, subjectivity and the fact that editors and proprietors can set the tone of, that, of a particular media organisation. And, you know, it's their organisation. Of course they can. But proprietors and editors do get invited in on this little charm offensive by the heads of the intelligence agencies. So they get invited to the you know, plush dining rooms in the HQs of the spies and just, you know, have a drink, have another port, old chap, and, you know, I'll just, this, this guy's a bit dodgy, we don't want to listen to this Shayla person, you know, he's, 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 he's a fantasist, don't cover him. So they get it sort of charmed by the, at a very high level and they can squash the stories as well. So where does that leave us as potentially a poor bloody whistleblower? <laughs> If I, I mean, there will be potential whistleblowers sitting out there just now. Think about it. They're out there. They're sitting in their MI5 or the CIA thinking, what am I going to do about this? This is criminal activity. What can I do? Where can I go? And it's a very difficult one because especially if they are more aware of all these different pitfalls and sort of control of the media, they will probably be very wary of approaching someone. And it's not just the legal restrictions. It's not just the possibility that the journalist you approach might be an agent of influence and will go running to the spies. It's also the concept of um, 
worrying how the media organisation will deal with your story because all too often journalists are working within this organisation that has a particular slant or a particular position on certain subjects. So it's very tempting for the journalists and the organisation to asset strip the, the whistleblower for information and then to put a slant on it and not represent what the whistleblower is trying to say. And I would say, you know, the whistleblower is the person from the inside. They know what they're talking about. It's worth listening to the facts. It's also very dangerous, I think, because for a journalist, it, it must be so tempting. You get a really good whistleblower. It could be career-making. But of course, if you're the whistleblower, it is career-breaking. And you end up not just losing your professional status, your life, your income. You can end up losing, well, you'll lose your social life with your colleagues. You could potentially lose your family life. Um, and of course, you could potentially end up in prison. So it's a huge step to take, a huge decision to make. So if I were a potential whistleblower, if I was sitting behind my desk in MI5 now, and I saw some shit-hot intelligence come in about, you know, MI6 involvement in the shooting of Colonel, Colonel Gaddafi yesterday or something like that. What am I going to do about it? It's an extrajudicial murder. Um, we shouldn't be getting involved in this. I would be tempted now, if I were in that position, to go to WikiLeaks or to another organisation of that ilk because you can do it anonymously. No source has ever been outed because of technological failure on the part of WikiLeaks. I mean, if Bradley Manning were, that, were one of their sources, he sort of outed himself. I mean, it's a terrible situation for the young man, but it wasn't a failure of the WikiLeaks uh, organisation. And certainly if I were a whistleblower now, you could put out the information, you could store relevant documents so they don't get lost in the process as well on the, a, a website. And you could sort of sit back and see what the reaction is like. I mean, the choice is still to go to a reputable journalist afterwards and work with the story. And of course, you know, if you do find a good one, you get the pastoral care, you do get the support. Um, but by going to WikiLeaks as well, you also cut out a whole other area of vulnerability, which is being caught in the process of whistleblowing to a journalist. And I think journalists do need to be very aware of some of the sort of security issues when dealing with sources from very secret organisations, where if they're under surveillance, it's going to be hardcore surveillance. So journalists need to think about getting two phones that are only ever used with each other between them and their source. They need to think about not meeting the source in the same place twice, not speaking to that source from their home or from their office or from their car because it might be bugged, all these sort of issues. And also getting some really good encryption like OpenBGP, for example, is a good start. So where does that leave us? I think the technological genie is out of the bottle. Whatever happens to WikiLeaks as an organisation, there will be others following on. And I think that is going to provide a very different playing field. I mean, it does level the playing field a bit already for the potential whistleblower, where they don't have to throw away their whole lives just to out a crime committed by others. And that is what we're talking about. So it does level the playing field a little bit more, make it slightly easier for a potential whistleblower. And I think, you know, in this current climate where we're seeing unending wars and these strange war on terror where people are tortured and kidnapped and assassinated now, we do need whistleblowers more than anything, and we need good journalism and good whistleblowers and a sort of symbiotic relationship between the two where they can trust each other and get these crucial stories out. So it's been, just to finish, it's been a real pleasure to have the chance to meet the Source Fabric team and to come to this conference because I'm so enthused by the idea that you have this symbiosis between the, the, the geek community, the hacker community and journalists as well to develop new tools to support journalism. But I would also suggest Think about the poor bloody whistleblower as well and think about tools that can enhance and protect the roles for people coming out of these sort of agencies and the problems they might potentially face. So if you can do that, I'd be very willing to, to help to feed in um, and very, very interested to see what comes out of any projects. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. Are you open to answer questions? Yep. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes. I just wanted to check. <laughs> um, are there any questions? I might have to shoot someone afterwards, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> A very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you for sharing it. Um, and maybe I missed this, but w what options were there for you to maintain anonymity in your disclosures with the, with the newspapers? Um, and also, uh, you. Can you give a sense of 
what the um, I thought you mentioned uh, August ninety seven and then August ninety eight that mm. stories were published. Were, were there just one or two stories, or were there a series of stories that evolved out of it? And what about the opposition in in Parliament? Did they <laughs> demand any kind of you know inquiry into into these allegations? Yeah, um, in terms of an anonymity. Um, because David knew about this Gaddafi plot and the fact that MI6 had got involved in a murder attempt, I think he felt the story would have more punch, more weight, um, if he sort of said, you know, I'm here, I want to give my evidence, I want an inquiry into this. Um, and of course, there's no guarantee of anonymity, because um, one hears rumours that journalists can be a bit of a gossip sometimes. So, <laughs> so I think he, he felt it would be the more honourable path to say, this is me, I'm going to put my name to this, and I want an inquiry, and I want to give evidence to this inquiry. Um, and also a sense of greater protection, because if you're in, if you're, if everyone's aware of who you are, then, you know, if anything nasty happens to you, there'll be an outcry. So, as I said, you know, one can get very paranoid, but you do have to think like that sometimes in these sort of situations. Um, yeah, in terms of when the stories came out, uh, perhaps I didn't make that clear enough, but initially the newspaper only wanted to go with the low-level stuff, because they were they sort of got this Gaddafi information and they were so blown away by it and so frightened by the possible ramifications that uh, they wanted to try and stand up the story themselves. And in fact, other information did come out subsequently that yes, there had been this plot. I mean, the French intelligence agencies knew about it, the CIA knew about it as well at a very high level. So um, there was that sort of aspect. So that's why the first stories were quite low level. The Israeli embassy story came out uh, in November 1997 through the terms of the injunction, ironically enough. And then the Gaddafi plot broke in 1998, and then David was arrested, and then he was not extradited and released, and other stories came out subsequently. So it was quite a sort of long and involved process. And in terms of the impact, um, we were very unfortunate with our timing, should we say, because the story broke on 24th of August 1997. And our calculations were that there'd be a media storm, that you know, there would be push for an inquiry, that the government, of course, as a knee-jerk reaction, would take out a gagging order, they take out an injunction, and of course then the whole of the British media would be up in arms saying, what about the free press, we're not standing for this. And so it came to pass, it all looked like we were getting the support we would need. Unfortunately, we went to bed happy about a week later in the south of France, we thought, phew. <laughs> and then we woke up the next morning and the news said, uh, Princess Diana died last night. <laughs> so you can't really factor in that sort of happening at that time and of course everything else was knocked out of the news and we found ourselves lost in Europe with no media support or anything. Uh, we were very fortunate, there was one journalist particularly, when I mentioned pastoral care, uh, called Mark Hollingsworth who did so much work on this case and he was wonderful because he was there for us all the way through and trying to look after us and think about our interests all the way through. So from a whistleblower point of view, if you can find a gem like that as a journalist, that adds so much you know, to the interpretation of the story and having him fight for you. Um, but yes, it was uh, unfortunate timing. I suppose it could have been worse that the story was supposed to break that night. <laughs> that would have been even worse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more question over there. You mentioned that uh, technology offers like new possibility and new chances for whistleblowing these days. But I think actually the, uh, the opposite is true because the same technology works on the other side for internal control like SureView or a similar technology to actually prevent whistleblowers mm. uh, to reach the out in the first place. So uh, do you see the uh, opportunities to go uh, away from technology again or what are the, um, the possibilities for a whistleblower these days? to also circumvent these channels? <laughs> um, you know, that is a, an interesting one because um, nowadays a lot of intelligence agencies, particularly the resurgent FSB, former KGB, are falling back on the old style rules, you know, the really low tech, meeting a person face to face, taking lots of precautions so that you're not followed to the meeting and everything. So I think um, WikiLeaks appears to have been technologically superior to whatever the governments can throw at it so far. And I'm sure other organisations will come along um, as well. We never underestimate how monolithic and, and slow and um, out of date a lot of these government IT organisations can be, even the spooks. Um, so I think that will, they will continue to technologically outpace in a small sort of guerrilla warfare sort of aspect, the possibility of, of betraying whistleblowers. Um, but yes, I mean, if you 
do get a whistleblower, or if someone has put something on WikiLeaks and then wants to come forward to push for an inquiry, put their name to it or whatever, then yes, you do need to think about uh, basic old-fashioned sort of security. Um, you know, all the old John Le Carre spy craft, where you have to sort of dry clean yourself to a meeting and just pass, do brush contacts and leave marks on benches. I mean, you know, read those novels if you want to know how to do that, they're great. But so I think there is a place for that still. But I think with the wonderful world of hackers and also the fact that so many young hackers are getting so politicized now as well as just being you know into the geek stuff but politically aware of digital rights and civil liberties and um, they can see the sort of Orwellian big brother approach coming on that there will be more and more people finding ways burrowing out of these sort of security layers and so I have joked many a time that I think geeks will save our save the world they will save our democracy it's back to the Superman image <laughs>